whole lot of text from the, the people involved there toward the protest, the Rossport campaign, the protest activity, uh, defeating uh, service charge collection taxes and uh, way before I possibly remember when I'm nervous. As you hear for a very short amount of time, we decided that the best thing to do is to focus on a couple of questions that we've been interested in asking, but if you've got questions you want to ask us, so, yeah, so, exactly. Sorry, I have to be so rushed. Thanks, Dave. Thanks, Dave. I'm sure I've been talking this time. No, it's okay. Best possible place. This is where we relax and take all experience. All right, so uh, John has got the first question. Where is he? Yeah. Okay. I don't. Uh, I was just wondering, how many of the pretty small official patents in the world today? I'm just wondering, what do you think particularly like relevancy or what role do you see playing in the future in the school of red kind of world? So when the moment 
came, people just carried out what they, was in their heads. And it was done in different ways in industrial areas in Catalonia, the peasant areas in Asturias and so on, that developed very rapidly. Uh, complex, you know, was a lot of things to be criticized. Uh, interesting, good proposals to how to win the war, uh, which have been mostly suppressed by now, but uh, the sensible idea as to how to fight Franco was coming from anarchists, in particular from Camilo Veneri, who was killed in the May days, an Italian anarchist who was at John. Uh, and uh, his uh, you know, it might not work, but he had the right idea, and it's an idea that's uh, very pertinent to the world since, and it's you know, not on the basis of knowing it, but these things are so obvious to people, they keep coming back, you know, without any history. Uh, but his uh, idea, which is highly pertinent, was that they should not fight a military war against Franco, it's not going to work. Uh, they should fight, a, if, to the extent that any fighting should be a guerrilla war, which is very natural in Spain. That's where the concept of guerrilla war developed in the Napoleonic Wars. And again, it's in people's heads. And the main thing that they should do is, is undercut the roots of the Republic's Franco army. Uh, the Franco army was a Moorish army that was coming from Morocco. And his sensible proposal was, you don't fight them, you cause them to collapse. And you cause them to collapse by dealing with their problems. I mean, the people in the Franco army are just as oppressed as you are. You know, they're not uh, some kind of beasts. They're Moroccans who were enlisted into the, essentially, foreign legion. It's the same Spanish legion, incidentally, which today, speaking of relevance, it's the same Spanish legion which in the last few days uh, has its commander announced that they're going to march on Madrid uh, to prevent uh, devolution in uh, in uh, Spain, or rights to Catalonia. Uh, so that's you know today's headline: same legion, you know, same commander, you know, not the same people, same kind of commanders. Uh, and then the uh, suggestion then, which applies now too, is to undercut the base uh, by supporting uh, the revolutionary movements in uh, in the North Africa. Uh, they were there. You know, there were Abdul Krim was organized a revolutionary movement to try to, you know, call for land, for freedom, ridding themselves of French and Spanish imperialism. And uh, Bernari's proposal was, well, okay, let's support them. If we support them instead of fighting them, we're, you know, they join us. Uh, they want land. They don't want uh, French boots on the necks. Uh, so, sure, let's all get together and fight the same war against the uh, the combined leadership on all sides. Now, of course, that would have utterly infuriated France and Britain and the United States, who would have totally berserk. But, uh, you know, if you, you had a choice at that point, shall we cater to the imperial powers and let them carve us up and you know, smash us and so on? Or shall we just uh, fight people's war against them? Uh, you know, could well work. I mean, it could have held off the Second World War, you know, because of the changes that might have taken place. Uh, but the, those are issues we are by no means did. Uh, like I say, park on the front pages right now, and they show up both in terms of uh, struggles against imperialism and different forms but the same principles, and also just the tremendous success in uh, collectivization and building a society without uh, you know, hierarchy and so on. One of the best descriptions of it, although he didn't understand what was going on, is George Orwell. He had really no idea what was going on, but he wrote, he was writing from the point of view of the Kuhn militia, you know, kind of semi trotskyite militia, and that's what he saw. So he didn't understand the anarchists at all. He didn't know anything about them. Uh, but he gave a very vivid portrayal of what it was like. So he'd never seen anything like that. You know, you go through Barcelona, nobody's calling him a sir. Comrades, uh, there's no hierarchy. Of people are participating. So I don't understand what it was. You know, a lot of things I don't like, but it's something you just have to appreciate. You know. Came back a couple months later, and he said it's totally different. You know, you're back to the bowing, scraping, the orders, uh, Stalinist, communist leadership that had taken over, crushed the revolution. Was in the process of crushing the revolution with the support of the West and the support of Franco. Uh, but 
that's, uh, you know, even from his skewed perspective, just as a perceptive human being, he saw something really important happening here. And if you read the uh, documents on the collectivization, by now they're available. Actually, when I was writing about it this a long time ago, I had to use uh, original documents, which I picked up in bookstores around 1940. But uh, by, by now they're all available. It's a kind of scholarship. The original documents are out. You can really learn quite a lot about it. And yeah, it's an inspiring experience, I think, with lots of lessons. Okay, uh, Ushi. Uh, you said before that uh, the class war of the curve, so that not everyone seems to be aware of that. Uh, just a question that I want to ask is uh, what do you think the significance and the relevance of class analysis is for libertarian social politics? Remains of continuing relevance. There are class differences that are important. Part of the strength of the anarchist tradition is to recognize that that's only some of the forms of hierarchy and domination. There's a lot of others, but they're crucially significant. They're struggling in Ireland all the time, and everywhere else. Recent strikes are an example. And the class war always goes on. Um, there's one class that relentlessly fights class war, the business classes. They never relent for a minute. And so they're always fighting the vicious class war. Uh, they want everybody else to pretend it doesn't exist. But you know, for them, it's a permanent, permanent war. Any attempt to, uh, and you know, the whole doctrinal system, schools, media, and so on, tries to prevent people from seeing it. They come up, we're all in it together, in harmony, this and that. But uh, what's the business world doing? And the business and government are so closely connected, you can barely distinguish them. But business, uh, government, uh, you know, educational hierarchies, uh, you know, they're always fighting the class war. I mean, every time you look at an advertisement on television, it's class war. It's trying to turn you into a passive consumer. So you really won't talk to other people and you know, try to figure out some wrong with all these things. Uh, there's not a moment when you're not engaged in class war. You can decide, you know, you can succumb to how to notice it, but it's uh, hitting you every minute of the day down to infants. I mean, when I watch uh, television with my grandchildren, you know, three-year-old kids, uh, you just tell them what's being presented to them on television. I mean, they're being deeply indoctrinated into passivity, conformism, Consumerism, uh, you know, the rejection of conflict, uh, failing. You know, this is just a class war, a constant class war in our stuff. So, sure, class analysis is important. It's not the only thing that's going on, but it's a major part. And Toby, I think in part in the sense of politics, and speaking, I've been with this since uh, the Americanization of South Vietnam. How have you noticed a change in the reception of yourself and your ideas? Well, um, when I started speaking about the invasion of South Vietnam, for one thing, you couldn't use the phrase. Um, it, it was years. I mean, in, in an educated audience, you still can't use the phrase. Like I was talking at Harvard Graduate School, you know, couldn't use the words. It would be like talking uh, in Sumerian or something. Uh, because the words don't exist. I mean, have you ever seen it in a newspaper or scholarly work or anything? I mean, there's no such thing except in the real world. There is still a such a thing. Uh, so first of all, you can talk about it. Uh, furthermore, the audiences were, uh, well, I don't know, three or four people at some of the living room, or uh, occasionally be at church, where uh, there be four people there, you know, the pastor, kindly gave us the church, or the organizer, or a, a drunk who walked in, <laughs> some other guy who wanted to want to murder him. That was a typical audience. Uh, when the uh, anti-war movement began in the early 60s, even close to the mid, like 1964, you know, of that late, if we wanted to have a meeting somewhere at, say, a college, uh, we'd have to bring together you know, half a dozen topics you know, Iran, Venezuela, you know, Brazil, Vietnam, you know, and maybe you get 10 people to come out because they're interested in different things. Uh, in fact, uh, it really, I mean, for the first pub in Boston where I lived, 
is the most liberal city in the country. They like to call themselves the Athens of America, Harvard, all this kind of stuff. Uh, but uh, it's the center of American liberalism. I mean, the first public meeting against the war was the International Days of Solidarity Against the War. It was October 15, 1965. And there were demonstrations all around the world. So we figured, OK, we'll try to have an outdoor demonstration in Boston. There had been one before on any scale. And there's a place in Boston, it's Boston Common, which is like the free speech area, sort of Hyde Park. So there was a march down to Boston Common, a couple of speakers. I was supposed to be one of the speakers. So, you know, big mobs of counter demonstrators, mostly coming from universities. Not there to break up the demonstration. Uh, yeah, couldn't get a word out. Nobody could be heard. In fact, the only reason we weren't slaughtered was there were a couple hundred state cops around who didn't like what we were saying, but didn't want to see people murdered on the Boston Common. <laughs> <laughs> Next day, in the newspapers, take a look at the Boston Globe, the most liberal newspaper in the country. Uh, the front page, the entire front page, was devoted to this. Uh, and the, big picture in front of a wounded soldier. You know, there's a soldier fighting for freedom, and uh, the rest of it was all about these uh, county rats trying to <laughs> undermine our brave soldiers, you know, that kind of stuff. The radio was full of it, you know, just denunciations. If you go to Congress, one of the people who later pretended to be, after the war went sour, uh, everybody suddenly became a long-time secret dove, you know, really secret.
declassified, you know, depending on papers, they're kind of like stolen archives. You get the real story, not what's declassified by the government. And therefore, they're almost ignored by scholarship and by the media, practically ignored. But they're very revealing. For example, one of the things they show is that the bombing of the North was planned in meticulous detail. You know, they really thought about it, how far should we go? You take a look at the problem in the South, it's, it's not even mentioned. It's do whatever you feel like. So, uh, uh, so there's barely any mention of planning. You want to target villages with B-52 bombing, do it, and so forth. Uh, and the anti-war movement is responsible for this too, because they kept to the same framework of overwhelming. Uh, and that's the picture that lasts in history. So the history of the war, that's what it is. Uh, the anti by the late 60s, things really had changed, and a lot of other things had changed too, because the, you know, the anti war movement just kind of integrated with a lot of other things that were going on. Uh, so you, you're barely beginning, beginning to get the beginnings of the feminist movement at that time. And the sources of it, I don't know what it's like here, but in the United States it was very striking to watch. Uh, part of the sources of the women's movement were the sexism of the anti war movement. Very striking. You can see it. Uh, the, especially the draft resistors. I was working a lot with resistance. And the draft resistors were brave people, you know, 17, 18 year old kids who are facing a real problem, not fun to spend you know, years in jail, go to exile, never get back home. And they felt righteous, you know. And part of the way you felt righteous was by uh, oppressing young women who then sort of supposed to serve and admire and so on. And the women, after a while, started to resent uh, because uh, the general, typical anarchist sentiments of not being want to, being, want to be kicked around were coming up. And that uh, led to a uh, critique of the sexism of the young resistors, which for many of them was a real crisis. I mean, I know some who actually committed suicide because they couldn't deal with it. You know, here's this sense that we're doing something really courageous, and, uh, but we're oppressors. How can we face that? Uh, and that was a good part of where the women's movement came from. The women's movement really didn't develop a major force until the 70s, but it was part of the group. Uh, the environmental movement was barely beginning. The civil rights movement which is an interesting story. As long as the civil rights movement was focused on you know, hideous uh, sheriffs in Alabama, it was very popular in the North. <laughs> but by the mid-60s, it was shifting to the North. The last couple of years, we just had Martin Luther King Day, you know, everybody celebrates Martin Luther King. What they celebrated is what he was doing in the South. By 1965, he was turning to organizing a poor people's movement. And that's all over the country. And in fact, when he was assassinated, it was at a time when he was in the midst of the speaking meeting the poor people's meeting. Well, that's out of, you know, kind of like out, going too far. You know. So when you read about Martin Luther King, they say, well, the last couple of years of his life, he kind of lost direction. You know. <laughs> uh, so it's okay to be self righteous about. Alabama sheriffs, but to not to look at what's happening in your neighborhood. It's the same thing. You know? uh, but uh, that was be the civil rights movement was beginning to turn into a you know, like a general movement of the poor. It was very frightening to power systems, and uh, but it was going on, and a lot of organizing was going on. There's a lot of craziness. You know? The youth culture was going on in its own way. You know, just revolt the music. Style address, all kinds of things. Uh, but the general effect was extraordinary. I mean, it's, uh, and it's lasting. Uh, the whole country just changed, became just more civilized. Uh, like my own university, MIT, uh, if when around 1960, say, uh, MIT was uh, white males, uh, well dressed, tops and jackets, obedient, <coughs> deferential, did their homework. So on. If you walk around the MIT today, it looks like this. Half women, literally, half women, you know, third minorities, casual dress, 
informal relationships, you know, to do serious work or serious before, but uh, just totally different. And the same is true all over the country. So as far as, say, reaction goes, the, you know, educated elite sectors are very more rigid than they were, because they were frightened by all of this. The tremendous backlash against sort of the liberal liberals and comes from everything else, all part of the backlash. But among the population, it's just expanded all over. You could talk in the, in the Idaho Washington border, in the little town where all you see in the town is uh, Christian evangelical posters and you know, National Rifle Association and so on. You know, Four thousand people show up. Uh, from nowhere, and it's around there somewhere. And that happens all over. I mean, I spend maybe an hour a night, I spend a lot of time answering email, but uh, probably an hour a night is just turning down invitations, which I'd really like to accept. Uh, and the, the, there are very few people, unfortunately, who are publicly available. You know, it's not the kind of thing that privileged people do. We're all obviously very privileged, but uh, they don't do it. You know, so there are very few people who, who will do these things. And they're just overwhelming demand, and they get the same reaction. I mean, you know, Howard Zinn, I'm sure, who is another one who's on the road all the time, though he's not young, he's older than I am, but uh, he's out there all the time. <laughs> <laughs> but, and he's just a garage with invitations, and he gets the same reaction to thousands of people showing up. And, you know, so it's just a tremendous change in the whole country. It became a lot more civilized. And it, it, you know, a lot of very striking ways, which aren't discussed much, but they're very real. So take in the 1980s, if you take a look at what happened, it's quite striking. When Reagan came in in 1981, he was facing a problem. He, you know, I don't know what was going on, but the guys around him were facing the problems in Central America, which were very much like what Kennedy faced in South Vietnam in 1961, very similar. And they tried to follow the Kennedy model. You know, Kennedy was their hero, uh, very much unlike the picture that's been created. Uh, they tried to follow in Central America the same model that Kennedy did in South Vietnam. You can see it step by step. Same white papers, you know, the communists are taking over, the whole business. Uh, the media went along totally, you know, the yeah, communists are taking over the world, uh, they, and so on. Uh, but they had to back off. Uh, they had to back off because it was just too much popular opposition. And a lot of it was coming from the church, a lot from popular groups and so on. So they backed off and they carried out the, what they call the clandestine war. That's a war which means everybody knows about it except the American population. I mean, obviously the victims know, the participants know, and so on. Uh, but they keep it away from the population so they don't find out about it. I mean, it's, it's called the name for it is called the Vietnam Syndrome, and there's an effort to present it as if Americans don't want to face casualties. It's a total lie. It has nothing to do with Americans facing casualties. You know, people are, if there's something they think of as like a just war, Second World War, you know, the American world casualties are hard to do it. What they don't want to face is aggressive war. But you can't say that. You know, you can't make that public. But there's a deep feeling that we don't want to be involved in an aggressive war. I mean, that's why they dropped the draft. Uh, the draft is a citizen's army. And they just can't get a citizen's army to fight colonial wars. That's something the British knew 200 years ago. You know, they didn't use British soldiers, they used mercenaries, French, everyone else. But the U.S. dropped the citizen's army. Uh, and uh, instead, they have a mercenary army. It's called a volunteer army. But it's just a mercenary army of the disadvantaged. People like Lindy England, you know, the woman who was this Abu Ghraib thing. You just look at her background, you see where they're coming from. I mean, they're really oppressed people. Uh, no education, no, no opportunities, nothing. They, uh, when they recruit for, for you know, soldiers, they don't go to Harvard Square. You know, they go downtown to Boston Slums. Uh, pick up people who figure, okay, maybe I've got a way out of this. And those kind of people you can't train to become, you know, train killers. Or you just use plain mercenaries. They're called contractors or something like that. But they're just mercenaries. They're <coughs> foreign legion. Uh, and, uh, or you use special forces like British.
British special forces have been used as mercenaries all over the world. They're really good kicking people in the face and so around, you know. But uh, the, uh, uh, the, that was part of it. But now got to the 80s, and they couldn't carry out an invasion. Uh, so they used mercenary forces from Taiwan, Britain, Israel, other places, uh, funding from Saudi Arabia, you know, just we're just uh, organized mercenary armies right? in, in Nicaragua, El Salvador, these state security forces. And they did carry out pretty hideous massacre. There was nothing like an invasion. You know, that's not B-52. You're getting the signal for time. Getting the signal for time. OK, well, last comment about this, because it's quite important and not discussed. That's something completely new happened in the 1980s, new in hundreds of years of, America, of Western imperialism. There was a solidarity in which people actually went to live with the victims. And that's never happened. You know, nobody thought to go live in a Vietnamese village during the Vietnam War. Nobody from France went to live in an Algerian village. It was considered very heroic if you wrote an article in Le Mans saying, you know, I don't like torture or something. And then you're a big hero, and so on and so forth. But in the 1980s, literally tens of thousands of Americans went to Central America. A lot of them stayed there. But, uh, uh, and they were mostly coming from the mainstream. One, one of the reasons why it's unknown is it was not happening in the elite centers. Like it wasn't happening in Cambridge. It was happening in churches in Kansas, and, you know, Arizona, and places like that. A lot was coming out of the Christian evangelical movements, contrary to what you hear. Uh, and the very serious, sincere people, very dedicated, just coming out of. <coughs> a much more civilized country. Uh, and when it gets to the global justice movement, you know, it's just something totally new and like it uh, anywhere you know, all over the world. So yes, there have been a lot of changes, very positive ones. I mean, you know, they're not going to be given headlines in the newspapers, of course, but uh, you know, they're happening. So you've never seen a group like this, certainly not 40 years ago, even 20 years ago. And now you see them all over the place. You know, I was up in Carol and my wife were up in Northeast Brazil, and they had on the six, seven years ago, I forget. And I was giving them various talks, but an anarchist group asked me to come talk. Northeast Brazil, in the Amazon. And I think uh, you enjoyed that one. Uh, so, uh, although we would really love to talk for hours on this yeah. subjects, I uh, want to thank you very much for taking the time out of your day. Thank you, Carol. Oh. Oh. So, Mela, Irish whiskey. Oh, <laughs>